Hello and welcome to the last part of AP STAT. This is section 12.2. And the final thing that we will be doing is we will be transforming nonlinear data. Okay. Back in chapter three, we were able to analyze the relationship between uh, two quantitative variables, uh, X and Y. And we looked to see if they had a linear relationship. We looked at the scatter plot. We looked at the residual plot to see if there were any patterns. And if it was linear, if the scatter plot was linear and the residual plot showed no patterns, then we said that a linear model was a good fit. If the scatter plot was not linear or if the residual plot showed clear pattern, then that means that a linear model was not a good fit. So we must develop new techniques to find uh, an appropriate model to, do, to model curved data or a curved relationship. So that's what we're gonna do in this section. Uh, we're gonna take the curved relationship, we're gonna transform it to make it a linear relationship because once it's linear, then we can use a least squares regression line to uh, generate a model. And then once we have a least squares regression line, we can go about making doing inferences on the least squares regression line like we did in the last section with a linear regression T interval and a linear regression t test. But those inference methods only work for linear regression. So our job is to transform it to make it linear. So here are some ideas. Um, this is called a power model. When you go to a pizza parlor, you order the pizza by its diameter. Like, oh, I want a 10 inch pizza or a 12 inch pizza or a 14 inch pizza. And that would be uh, you know, a small, medium or large. But the amount of pizza that you get to eat depends on the area. And the area of the circle is pi r squared. So the area of a pizza, in our case, with x diameter, 10, 12, 14, so on, would be pi multiplied by x over 2 squared, because x is the diameter, which ultimately gives you pi over 4 times x squared. And this gives you the area of the pizza, the amount of pizza that you can eat, given that with x being the um, diameter. This is a power model, and a power model is in the form of y equals a times x raised to the p power, where a is a coefficient, p is the power, and then x is the variable. So in our case, a is pi over 4, and p is 2. So this would look like a quadratic uh, uh, function. It's called a power model. Okay, although power models are in the form of y equals a times x to the p, there is a linear relationship if we were to transform this. And instead of looking at x versus y on a graph, which would definitely be a curved relationship, if we looked at x to the p and y, which would be transforming our x values, the relationship x to the p and y would be a linear relationship. Okay, so if every point became x to the p comma y as opposed to x comma y, it would turn our power model into a linear regression model. Another thing that you could also do here is, is take the, the pth power. So in our case, instead of looking at uh, x squared comma y, we can look at x comma square root of y. Okay, so there's a couple of ways we can transform uh, a power model to make it linear. And you'll see that here. So imagine that you're put in charge of organizing a fishing tournament where prizes are given for the heaviest fish caught. It's very difficult to weigh a flopping fish uh, on, a, on a very delicate scale. The easier thing to do is to, once you catch the fish, is to find out its length, easier to measure the length while on the boat as opposed to its weight. And then what you can do is based off of its length, you can get or estimate its weight. Okay, and here is some data about the length of a rockfish versus its weight. And you can see that this relationship, length versus weight, is curved. Right? It's non-linear. Since length is one-dimensional and weight, like mass or volume, is three-dimensional, a power model is a model that would fit this relationship. So instead of looking at a power model, we're going, we want to transform this into a linear relationship. So instead of looking at length versus weight, the graph to the right 
is showing length cubed versus weight. And you can see that the relationship between these two variables has now linearized. And you can see length cubed versus weight. Or we can look at it as length versus the cubed root of weight. And again, this would also be a linear relationship. You're transforming either the X or the Y variable to turn a curved relationship into a linear relationship. So the two ways, two possibilities of transforming power models would be taking all of our X's and raising them to the actual P power and then comparing that relationship to Y. So it'd be X to the P comma Y, or you could take the Pth root of all the Y values, the response variable, and it'd be X comma the Pth root of Y. And that would transform the nonlinear data into a linear relationship. What we're going to do is we're going to use logarithms to transform power models. And here's how we do it. So to achieve linearity in a power model, we're going to apply logarithmic transformations. Now, what you'll see here is they use uh, log base 10. Uh, it, this also works for natural log. And I, personally, I always use natural log just because I like writing LN better. And the LN uh, natural log is just used more commonly in the mathematical world. You don't, you very rarely use log base 10, but this is done using log base 10. That's okay. If you just replace log with LN, it would be the same thing. So <coughs> if we take our power model, which is Y equals A times X to the P, where A and P are both constants, and we take the log of both sides, we got log of Y equals the log of A times X to the P using our logarithmic rules of expanding and condensing logs, because I'm multiplying a times x to the p, I can separate this into two logs, where it's log of a plus log of x to the p. And then using our power rule of logarithmics, I can take that p power and I can bring it to the front so I'd have log of a plus p times log of x. So you, ultimately your equation becomes log of y equals log of a plus p times log of x, which would show that taking the logarithm of both variables, taking the log of x and the, the log of y, take turns a power model or a power relationship into a linear relationship. So instead, like previously in the last two slides I just showed you, you, you could have, uh, you know, take x and raise it to the p power, or you could have taken the p root of y, but now I'm showing you, if you just take the log of X and the log of Y and look at the relationship between the log of X and the log of Y, that would also linearize a power model. If you look carefully, the power P in the power model now becomes the slope of the linear regression line, right? Because P is the coefficient in front of this slope here, log of X. So in a, in a power model, the power is actually the slope, right? Because we're changing a power model and we're turning it into a linear model. And in the linear model, the power is the slope. So the slope is very important because it helps us find the power of our power model. Okay. So if a power model describes the relationship between two variables, a scatter plot of the logarithm, logarithms of both variables should linearize the data. So again, log of X versus log of Y. And then once we linearize the data, we can fit a least squares regression line to the transformed linear model. Here's an example. On July 31st, 2005, a team of astronomers announced that they had discovered what appeared to be a new planet. Woo -woo! They had first observed the object almost two years earlier using a telescope. Originally named UB313, the potential planet is bigger than Pluto. And as we all know, Pluto is actually no longer a planet. So at this time, they are trying to add planets, and in the last 15 years, they've taken a planet away. So here we are. Anyway, this planet is bigger than Pluto and has an average distance of about 9.5 billion miles from the sun. Okay. Uh, for reference, Earth is only 93 million miles from the sun. Could the new astronomical body, now called Aries, be a new planet? At the time of the discovery, there were nine known planets, and like I said, there are now eight known planets out of the solar system. <clears throat> Here's the data on the distance of the sun and the period of revolution of those planets. The distance from the sun is being measured in astronomical units. 
astronomical units is just the number of Earth distances from the sun. So as you can see, Earth is one Earth distance from the sun. That makes sense. Venus is less than one Earth distance because it's closer. Whereas Mars is one and a half Earth distances from the sun because it's a little bit further. Okay, so an astronomical unit is the number of Earth distances from the sun. And then how long it takes to revolve around the sun is in Earth years. So again, one Earth year is Earth. Mars is longer. Venus is shorter. And so forth. Okay. Pluto has a very long year. If we look at the data on the left, you will see the astronomical units versus the period. And you can see that this is a curved relationship, non-linear. So our task is going to be to transform this curved relationship. We got to decide, is it a power model or not? Let's see. So the graph below shows a result of two different transformations. So the first transformation they did was they just took the natural log of the Y values and left the X values the way they are. And so they graphed the X versus the natural log of Y. And you can see that it's definitely still a curved relationship. But if you look at this graph over here, they're, they're looking at the relationship between the natural log of X, ln of distance, versus the natural log of Y, ln of period. And you can see that this graph is very linear. So because they took the, they linearized uh, the data by taking the natural log of both x and y, we can see that a power model is going to be a good model for this data. Because we said if it's a power model, then taking the natural log of x and y would linearize that data. Here is a mini tab output for the linear regression analysis of the transformed data. Okay, so this is the mini tab output for the natural log of x versus the natural log of y. Our task is to give the equation of the least squares regression line using these values. Again, the coefficient of my variable, this is going to be the slope. This is the standard error of the slope. Here's my standard deviation of the residuals. This is everything we did in the past unit. Our task is to find the regression line. So the regression line is going to be the natural log of the period. Because remember, we're looking at ln of x versus ln of y. So the natural log of the period and then a hat, because remember, this is the predicted value. So putting a hat over it makes it a predicted value. Equals, this is the y-intercept, 0.0002544. Plus, this is my slope, 1.49986. It comes from right here. And then multiply by the natural log of the distance. Because again, we're looking at the relationship of natural log of x and natural log of y. Okay, so we're going to use our model from part B to predict the period that it would take the, the, the revolution of Aries, which is supposed to be our uh, possible new planet. And we know that the astronomical units is 102.15. So it's 102 Earth distances away from the sun. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 102.15 and we're going to input it into the distance. So it's going to be this value plus this value multiplied by the natural log of 102.15. And that gives us 6.939. Now this is the natural log of the period. If we're trying to find the period to get rid of a natural log, we take E and raise it to the power of 6.939. And that will get rid of the period. So this, this value is about 1,032 years, Earth years. That's how long it would take for Aries to revolve around the sun if it was actually a planet of ours. So again, if the data is a power model, you take the log or natural log of both X and Y to achieve linearity. You can make a scatter plot of the transformed data and with that new scatter plot, you can then make a linear regression line because the data should be approximately linear. That's a power model. We also have an exponential model. The difference is that my variable is now in the exponent. So in an exponential model, we're in the form of y equals a times b to the x. 
So this is my exponential model. Let's go ahead and linearize this. When we linearize this, we take the log of both sides. So we have log of y equals log of a times b to the x. Using my, uh, my logarithmic rules, I can separate this into two logs. And then of course, I can bring the x value in front. So here, I get log of y equals log of a plus x times log of b. This is different. So in the previous, uh, in, the, in a power model, the slope of my, of my transformed line was the power of my power model. Now, the slope of my transformed line is the log of my base of my exponential model, log of b. So as you can see, I'm taking the log of the y values but I'm not taking the log of the x values. Whereas in a power model, I end up taking the log of both x and y. And that's the difference. In an exponential model, it's x versus log of y. Here's an example. Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel Corporation, predicted in 1965 the number of transistors on an integrated circuit chip. Huh, my dog, he looked at me when I said chip. Integrated circuit chip would double every 18 months. This is Moore's law, one way to observe the revolution in computing. Here is the data of the dates on the dates and the number of transistors for Intel. So here they are, the date and the number of transistors. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. When you graph this, <laughs> you get something very curved. It looks very exponential. Okay, the, they graph x which is years since 1970 and they graphed y which is number of transistors and they graph it it looks super non-linear our task is to linearize this so if this truly was an exponential model then taking the log of the y values and graphing them versus just the x values should linearize data let's see if that's true aha you see this graph looks much more linear and this is graphing the years since 1970 so x versus the natural log of y okay so this shows that an exponential model would be a good model for this data because taking the log of the y's and graphing them versus just the x values linearizes the data okay so we're looking at x versus natural log of y Here is the mini tab output they got for the linear regression model of the transformed data. So this is the linear model. This is X versus natural log of Y. So you can see my X is still years, but my Y value is gonna be the natural log of Y. So if we are trying to create a least squares regression line, it's going to look like this. The natural log of Y hat, because again, predicted value equals the y-intercept, which is this value right here, the coefficient of the constant, 7.0647, plus 0.36583, which is the slope, which is happens to be the natural log of b, and then multiply by the years since 1970, because my x values haven't changed. They have not been transformed, just my y values have. And this is my least squares regression line based off of this mini tap output. Okay, now we're gonna make a prediction of the number of transistors on an Intel computer chip in 2020, which would have been last year. Um, so this is in the past now. And so years since 1970 becomes 50 because 50 years since 1970. So we input 50 into here, multiply these values out, Again, this gives us the natural log of the transistors is 25.3562. Our task is to get transistors. So to get rid of a natural log, we take E and raise it to the power of 25.362. And that gives us a whole lot of transistors, 1.028 times 10 to the 11th power. one with a whole bunch of zeros at the end.
Okay, this is an exponential model. All right, let's input this data into our calculator. And let's show you how to do it on a calculator. So this is my X values, these are my Y values. <clears throat> you can pause it right now because I'm gonna keep talking about this. It says some college students collected data on the intensity of light at various depths in the lake. And here is the data. It gives you the depth and then it gives you the light intensity in lumens. So step one is to put this into our calculator and make a scatter plot. So <clears throat> in my calculator, it's already there. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a scatter plot. Dum, 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 dum. Here's my calculator. And when my data is already right here, you'll see it. Here's my data, list one, list two. Oh, let me just delete list three and four for now. So I'm gonna turn my first stat plot on, which is gonna make me a scatter plot. And here's my scatter plot curved right as you can see non-linear so since it's non-linear we are going to have to linearize it. it says part b linearized data is it a power model or an exponential model let's find out if it is a power model that means we would have to take the log of both x and y if it was just an exponential model that means we would take just the log of y so in my data I have X and Y in list one and list two. In list three, I'm gonna make this the natural log of all of my X values. So the natural log of list one. This is the natural log of X. In list four, this is going to be the natural log, the natural log of all my Y values, which is LN of list two. So now I have X, Y, ln of x and ln of y and uh, my goal is to find out do i have a power model or an exponential model so let's go back to my stat plots i'm going to turn to the first one i'm going to change this first one and the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to graph uh my x values versus the natural log of my y values which is in list four if this is linear that means i'm going to have an exponential model so this is x versus natural log of y. So let's see if this is linear. This looks pretty linear to me. Okay. I'm going to just double check. I'm going to go into my stat plot. I'm actually going to turn this one off and go to my other stat plots, plot two. And I'm going to turn this one on. This one is list three versus list four. This is the natural log of X versus the natural log of Y. So if this is linear, then a power model would be a good model for my data. So when I graph this, you'll see, I think this looks curved, right? But to some, you might be like, well, it looks kind of linear. Well, how do we determine if something is linear? Because the scatter plot's not a good enough uh, visual because our eyes can't always see the curve pattern based off of my scaling. So in order to figure out, is this actually linear? I'm going to have to create a residual plot. So let's think about this. I need to create a residual plot of the natural log of, uh, natural log of X versus the natural log of Y. In order to do that, I need to create a regression line for the natural log of X versus the natural log of Y. Cause I need my calculator to calculate residuals for me. So here I am doing a regression line for the natural log of X and the natural log of Y. This is my regression line. And look at this, my R value, super high. R squared, super high, right? But remember, that doesn't give us, that doesn't tell us if this is a linear model or not. The only way to look to see if, a, if it's a linear model is to actually look at the residual plot, okay? <clears throat> so let's go ahead. Let's turn off this plot here. And let's go to plot three. Uh, plot three, I'm gonna turn on. This is 
my residual plot. A residual plot is the x values. My x values are the natural log of x versus my residuals. Now again, residuals can be found in lists. They're all at the bottom. They're automatically calculated after you calculate the uh, after you calculate the regression line. Okay. So again, here I am, plot three. I'm doing a residual plot, and what you'll notice is something crazy. Wow, look at that pattern. This is a clear pattern in the residual plot. This is clearly going to end up being curved data, but to my naked eye on the scatter plot, it looked kind of linear, it was like questionable. But here we are, clearly seeing that this is curved data. All right, there's a pattern in the residual plot. And therefore, ln of x versus ln of y is not linear. Okay, therefore, it's going to be x versus ln of y, which again, it was my very first plot that I made. So let's turn stat plot one on and turn plot three off. And let's view it again. This is my linear transform data. This is x versus ln of y. This is going to be mean that a power, oh sorry, an exponential model is the best model for my data. Okay. All right, and here is the actual graph that you should have seen on your calculator. You can see depth versus the natural log of intensity, which is in lumens. Okay, and then if we were to create a least squares regression line, we could do it two ways. Either they're going to give us a mini tab output, which they do here, or let's, before we even do this, let's show us in the calculator. This is what the regression line should look like. Again, I'm gonna create a regression line by going to calc, going to linreg a plus bx. I'm doing list one versus list four, which is x versus ln of y. And when I hit calculate, I get my linear regression model. Here is my y-intercept, here is my slope. And if we go to the mini tab output, you will see that is essentially the same thing. The y-intercept and the slope are right here. So when we are creating a regression line, it's going to be, oh, it's going to be the natural log of intensity equals my y-intercept plus my slope multiplied by x, which is the depth in meters, because it's x versus natural log of y. So, if we have a power model, you would take the log of both x and y. If we have an exponential model, you would take the log of just the y value and leave x the way it is. Your job is to take this curved data and try to linearize it. That's our goal. Okay, that's it. You made it through AP stat. Congratulations, pat yourself on the back. It's all over. Bye-bye.